we all know obesity is a chronic disease or we can call it a chronic problem that is increasing in the past few decades, becoming more prevalent in all age groups, both in men and increasing in women, treatment of which is um, uh, to achieve weight reduction. The question is how we do it. That's precisely why we have these uh, panelists to help us uh, go about it. In that process, I think one thing to keep in mind is we want to make these patients not only decrease the BMI, but get healthier. That's why I think the topic is apt, uh, addressing both obesity and nutrition, and how to keep patients healthy as we achieve this weight reduction. Now let's look at this slide, uh, which is from Endocrine Society scientific statement about obesity management, uh, Endocrine Reviews 2018. Um, looking at percentage of uh, increase um, in overweight, obese, and extreme obese, uh, people in the population from 1960 to 2012. And as you can see, uh, it's uh, increasing in the past few decades. And uh, if you look at the US population, it's about 68.5% of the adult population is overweight or obese. And uh, BMI of more than 30 is uh, found in 35% of men and 40% of women. And in younger population, two to 19 years, it's about 17%. Now, the, what is concerning is look at the extreme obesity in the slide, and it's, uh, take, it's taking off. That's a difficult group to deal with um, without surgery. We cannot achieve the goals without surgery. A very difficult area to work with. So now I'm going to um, have Nitin continue. Right, so uh, as mentioned, yes, obesity has reached pandemic proportions globally. We all agree on that. When we talk of women specifically, yes, it, it was more common in women, but the gap seems to just get wider. And when we talk of Indian data, and this is from the National Family Health Survey data, uh, where we looked at uh, over 600,000 people, uh, and we see that the jump or the increase in the prevalence of obesity is to the scale of 54%. Yes, she's not here. Yeah, this is a question to Dr. Sarita Bajaj. We'll come to it, come to this later uh, when she arrives. Okay. Yes, absolutely. Okay. Are women held to different standards when it comes to weight? Does this cause more challenges like stress, depression, and social isolation? Is it peer pressure or self-imposed or societal norms? Anyone can take the question. Yes, so good morning, everybody. It gives me great pleasure to be here. And we are truly missing Dr. Bajaj, but we thought in case we don't want to disrupt the flow, we'll try to answer some of these questions. And she can chime in as soon as she's here. Is we really? She has to reach, right? No, she has to Okay. Ah, okay, okay, she's not going to be here with us, okay. So I think this is very important to address since the whole topic is about her. Are women held to different standards when it comes to weight? And I would say yes, the answer, especially in India or worldwide, I would say the answer is yes, because we all expect women to be super women. You know, we don't want her just to be playing the role of a mother, of a daughter, of a teacher. We want her to be playing all of the above. And this really makes them makes it difficult for her that she needs to be playing the role of a homemaker, whereas also trying to maintain her weight and especially in correlation to her health. I think Dr. Bajaj and uh, Nitin and Dr. Puma have put together some slides. So if we can see the next slide, sorry, it's a very busy slide. And you can see that when we start looking at our women with obesity, we need to be going through a stepwise approach. Um, just to kind of wake up the audience and get your crowd input, I thought I would just pose a question I asked I was I'm just returning from a family trip and I thought a lot of women over there of all age groups I asked them why do you think women are becoming obese and what do you think and they're all homemakers what do you think the number one answer was the answer was marriage okay <laughs> they said they all said we put on weight after marriage and what was the number two answer was childbirth 
So certainly, I think we are all in unison, all on the same page. And this is kind of exactly what this slide is telling you. I think humor is important for us to remember these things. So if marriage is truly making us obese, the answer is not to get married, of course. Uh, to not get married is not the answer. But how do we go about addressing this early on, primordial prevention, as we are saying? So in this particular slide, if you, I mean, it's really hard for me even to see. The number one thing we are asking you to screen for, and I think every slide will just have one highlight, it says screen for depression. So screen for what went wrong. I mean, marriage should make you happy. Marriage should not make you feel down or any life altering event, not simply marriage. So there is life altering events that happen in women, not just socially, but also hormonally speaking. So every age in life, so if most of you might have daughters in the room, so puberty, when they hit puberty, there are different kind of stressors. When they get married and they get pregnant, there are different kind of stressors. All of these hormones will affect you at a very different level. And I think I'll pass it to Neeta to add on to that. So yes, there are different standards for women. I truly believe that because a woman uh, has so much more on her plate and she's expected to uh, look good. She's expected, and if, even women expect that from themselves. It's not just societal pressure. Women expect that from themselves because they want to do so many things. They want to look good, want to wear this or want to wear that. And so there are so many aspects to wanting to be slim or wanting to lose weight so that part is uh, definitely there and it is a challenge now what Rucha said about marriage being one of the major issues uh, why women put on weight is not marriage in itself but the duties that marriage entails of a, from a woman what it entails for, for what a woman should be doing after she gets married what is expected of her all of those things take a toll in terms of time in terms of priority and because of these things the natural fallout or let's say the outcome of that is a woman putting on weight and of course childbirth and the way childbirth is handled in India in the family and societal pressure because of that uh, women tend to put on weight and this is not recognized. It's almost a given, oh she's a mother of two, she's bound to be overweight. So that kind of taken for granted kind of an issue and aspect is the one that uh, does not allow for women to seek help actually for obesity. So. Uh, that is what I would say. Yeah, good afternoon. Um, prior to marriage, a woman really takes care of herself. In India, uh, finding a match for a obese or an overweight uh, girl is a little difficult. So a lot of you know, uh, effort is put prior to marriage in maintaining weight. But once the lady is married, she stops taking care of herself because it's thought now the marriage is done and then you know the celebrations after marriage and the parties after marriage starts happening and the priorities change as ma'am said the priorities change and the family starts expecting a lot from the woman it is just i don't know how why is it thought that just taking the seven feras or getting married you know changes the entire personality of a woman and she will suddenly become a responsible a person who can take care of the entire family and the whole mindset is expected to change and suddenly if she starts giving more priority to herself she is made to feel guilty it's not correct so i think uh, once the, the the girl is married the priority to the health should be made important then the second thing is the food changes the, the entire food that she was eating before marriage and the food that she eats after marriage so much so much culture is changed so definitely it, it brings a you know it takes a task uh, toll on the lady's health when the food changes the food uh, she's not able to have the same kind of food she used to before marriage and maybe sometimes she's not even able to demand the kind of food she wants so there is a lot of uh, difference in the lifestyle she used to live before marriage and after marriage and it's not only the marriage or the puberty it's also pre and post menopause time when the lady puts on weight so if you would want to add in the menopause time the hormonal changes yes yes madam um, i come from a different perspective on that if we uh, think of women having the responsibility of looking after the family 
I think they can be role modeling as well in terms of healthy cooking for the entire family and not for themselves. And we heard from the first panel that uh, healthy food does not need to be tasteless. It, it can be made tasty. And I think women are the realm of making that change. So yeah, it can start from the woman and it can spread to the family about healthy habits as well. So Dr. Shilpa, adding to this, um, so we all, now I understand, I think we have to get to the root cause of the problem. Uh, not just prescribe diet or exercise, just get into the root cause of what exactly is happening in the individual's background and address that. Now, when you give them a diet, do you go into these aspects and address that rather than giving a diet plan alone? So uh, this is a question which is frequently asked and Shubda will agree with me. What is it that you, which norm do you follow? ICMR, how do you decide the calories? So typically calories are decided on what the person is eating rather than what they should be. So you know, if somebody comes eating 1800 calories, we are not going to give them 1000. We are obviously going to uh, gradually go down. So while we consider net calories, also we consider cooking methods, like ma'am said, or the uh, region from which they come from, or their likes and dislikes. In fact, that takes up more space than actually the macronutrient distribution, because a lot of times if we, uh, you know there are uh, diet plans available on Google, you don't need mm. a dietitian. Mm. But the point is they are not followed because they are not catered to. So, you know, while they might talk about eating something, you don't know how to make it, or your mate doesn't know how to make it, or if they both know, then you don't, you, you are unable to swallow it. So, you know, it is very, very important that they are uh, particularly catered for the person who is going to eat. And of course, then macronutrients and other things are important as well. Okay, thank right. you. So, that's great. And coming back to you, Dr. Rucha, and you did mention this, uh, the two most common reasons you got the other day, marriage and childbirth, but do you think there are other reasons as well? So yes, certainly, you know, coming back to a more scientific perspective, as Dr. Nitin showed, obesity is on the rise. And from our own Indian data uh, done by you know, Dr. Nitin himself in some of the studies he's quoting, as well as from several ICMR India DIAP studies, they have shown a couple of things. So number one, of course, certain hormonal diseases such as thyroid is more common in women. So we do not want to forget that. Of course, obesity, when it boils down to doesn't matter what diet you give or an anti-obesity medication, we have to always think about calories in and calories out, as uh, Shilpa was just mentioning. So a sedentary lifestyle, and Nitin was just showing you some beautiful slides on how sitting is also contributing to the, gear, the gain in weight. So I would like to clump them as, you know, as he has rightfully done so, as social influences, which we already spoke a lot about. Number two is the hormonal influences. So number one is thyroid. Number two is polycystic ovarian syndrome. Pushings, which is rare, but still more common in women versus men. So you don't want to forget these zebras as well. Medication, so women have much more chances of autoimmune disorders leading to a higher chance of using steroids for treatment. And therefore these steroids can also predispose them to uh, gaining weight. Certain other illnesses, certain other tumors and conditions such as hypothalamic tumors can also contribute. Now let's not forget also, if you go back to the, you had a slide on the reasons that, uh -huh. so yeah, that's a nice summary slide. Shift workers, women are becoming just as aggressive as men. So shift work, we are seeing a lot of working online, working at help, at home, on, uh, on computers and screens. So that is also an important re reason why we are gaining weight. Now, and the hormonal changes that a woman goes through, again, I'm not going back. We have gone through adolescence, puberty, the perimenopausal area that Shukta spoke about. Last but not the least, very important is the post-pregnancy weight retention. And I really think we do speak a lot about that because we want to discuss primordial prevention. When we are talking about women and health, we know that this is beginning in the womb. I had the chance to attend a beautiful session by Dr. Yagnik at Obesity Week just two weeks ago in San Diego, where he has shown three generations of women. So F0, F1, and F2, wherein in the Pune Nutrition Study, they've looked right at mothers, their daughter, and the granddaughter, and they have shown that this genetic predisposition, because it's not on the slide, we do see a genetic predisposition being passed on through the generations with a fat distribution in the visceral area. So he has shown a thrifty 
uh, phenotype for the baby as well, the thin, fat Indian baby. So I think that's important. And there are certain genes which we already know about, such as the FTO gene, which has been described in the Indian population. So I think I'll stop right there. One of the contributing factors is injudicious use of hormonal preparations, uh, typically for cultural practices like period postponement, or you know, uh, self-prescribed or repeat prescription on their own of any birth control pills without a proper follow-up and surveillance. This is something I commonly face in the clinic of excessive weight gain on Depo-Provera, injections taken for contraception or a progesterone preparation or birth control pills and having an elevated liver enzyme, fatty liver and obesity amongst women. Question to Dr. Meera. Focusing specifically on reproductive age group, a lot of women put on weight in the postpartum period. How in your practice do you suggest them to prevent that? Uh, primarily insist on the fact of breastfeeding and continuation of breastfeeding. Uh, we recommend at least 18 months to 24 months of breastfeeding and six months of exclusive breastfeeding, including nighttime, without top of feeds, without even water for the baby. That itself induces weight loss because the amount of calorie expenditure is better than two hit circuits, about 750 to 800 calories. But unfortunately, the nullifying fact for this weight loss is people think they need to eat for two. That is when the insult comes in, when the benefit of the breastfeeding process itself is nullified. The second aspect which I insist on to keep mobile, I mean, just having a baby on your lap and breastfeeding, yes, it helps, but movement is medicine, so keep moving. You do not need to prescribe an exercise strategy or a gym prescription. Just keep moving in activity burst throughout the day. That is far better than hitting the gym in the morning and not moving at all for the rest of the day. So 10 minute burst activity, even if they want to dance in front of the telly, that's fine. So keep moving, but address your nutritional requirements like your calcium so that they don't develop backache and quote that as a reason for not able to do exercise. This is a very common problem which they quote blaming the anesthetist or the obstetrician for that. But unfortunately, it's the calcium deficiency. Thank you. Very practical insights uh, there. Uh, we did speak that uh, about uh, 30 to 40 percent of Indian women have overweight and obesity, but what about the remaining 60 percent? And I asked Dr. Neeta, what is this normal weight obesity enigma? You've done work on it two decades before, published. And uh, so what do you think? Uh, how common is this and how does this help us understand the lean PCOS? Right, right. So normal weight obesity is a term uh, coined for uh, the typical thin fat Indian and when it comes to women, women also have normal weight obesity. So simply put, it means the woman looks normal by BMI standards but is obese by way of adiposity where most of the fat is visceral, centrally located, which is of course quite toxic. So normal weight obesity is an obesity in disguise and if not detected in time, then it can lead to the same kind of uh, the consequences as a person who is obese. And way back, maybe like 10, 12 years ago, Nitin and I had done some studies on normal weight obesity, where we had checked, I think, HSCRP, yes. we had checked uh, the HOMA IR, and we had checked a whole lot of other uh, parameters, and we found that uh, the values for normal weight obesity lay exactly in between those of normal people and frankly obese people, but more towards the frankly obese people. Which means to say that uh, it is as uh, bad or toxic as those people who are frankly obese. What it means is that these are people, the thin fat Indians so to speak, these are the people who uh, have the same kind of pathophysiology of insulin resistance. They are the same people who probably have fatty livers but at lower BMIs, and that brings me to uh, the concept that Roy Taylor put forth recently about a personal fat threshold, and which is so true for Indians because the personal fat threshold actually drives 
fat into the liver and other viscera and centrally at lower body mass index than our Caucasian counterparts. What it simply means is that these are the people who are going to benefit from the same therapeutic strategies that you would use for an obese individual. And therein comes the lean PCOS phenotype. So the lean PCOS phenotype is very much akin to a normal weight obesity individual. So PCOS is one of the consequences. Diabetes is another. Coronary artery disease is another. So a lean PCOS is simply a normal weight obese uh, woman who has got the same kind of metabolic problems as an obese PCOS person. And the, uh, to, uh, if this is understood, you will also understand, and research has shown, and I think Nitin has done some studies on this as well, where even a lean PCOS can benefit metabolically by losing some more weight. The only problem is convincing them, exactly. because they already look lean, so uh, making them lose some more weight is not acceptable culturally. People are going to comment and you're looking so thin, you look ill and all those kind of things. But metabolically speaking, definitely there is going to be some kind of uh, metabolic, uh, let's say, improvement by losing some more weight, even in a lean PCOS, because the pathophysiology is the same. So if you're using weight loss for an obese PCOS, the same thing applies even to a lean PCOS. It's just a question of phenotype. So Absolutely. So very well said. And this brings us to the diet again, that we, even for the lean PCOS, we have to prescribe them a diet. But we prescribe diets, patients lose weight, and after six months, they are back to their square one. Sustainability is a big problem. So in your experience, uh, uh, Mr. Shilpa Joshi, so, what you say? So um, diet is as good as the sustainability of diet. Otherwise, really, it's all about yo-yo, so losing weight and gaining it back. And therefore, uh, standard diets don't work. Uh, one, the diet has to be catered to a particular person, to their lifestyle. And very important is uh, uh, other confounding factors like travel, like festivals, marriages, have to be accounted for while planning a diet. So, uh, you know, because these are the reasons, if you ask the patient, why did you lose, uh, gain weight? Then they'll say, Ghar pe shadi thi. Yeah, I was traveling uh, or something, uh, you know, this kind of, so probably use of meal replacement or giving them options which can be eaten out. I think that is very important because weight maintenance is a lifelong phase. Weight loss is just a six months or eight months phase. But if one cannot cater for weight maintenance, then the whole point of the weight loss diet is sort of not there. Absolutely. And bringing in the concept that obesity is now a chronic disease, the way in a patient with diabetes, you wouldn't just give a prescription and say that's the end of it for the rest of your life. You need to follow that patient every three months, six months, and lifelong. Very similar with obesity and very similar with diet prescriptions. I move on to my next question to uh, 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 regarding uh, the medications, and this was alluded to a little while ago. May I request Dr. Bhuma to say uh, what is your take on OCPs and all these medi medications that cause weight gain in women? Okay, so uh, we have touched upon in the previous discussions <clears throat> about the various problems that we deal with along with obesity, diabetes, depression, um, and other uh, issues. And we have to be very careful in choosing the medications, especially in obese. Uh, diabetic women, um, insulin and sulfonylureas and glitazones uh, are, uh, tend to cause uh, weight gain. We should ch choose drugs that can cause weight loss or be weight neutral. The GLP-1 analogs, SGLT-2 inhibitors, and metformin are the ones to choose. But keeping in mind they're women of reproductive age and we have to be uh, looking at them preconception and adjusting these medications. Antidepressants, again, choose uh, the, the right ones that don't cause a lot of weight gain. Antipsychotics, anticonvulsants, carbamazepine, gabapentin, and valproate. And uh, steroids, I think it's hidden in the bottom. Uh, obese women with arthritis, inflammatory uh, issues, had to be have to be on um, long term steroids, which tend to cause weight gain. Again, we have to keep an eye on that and monitor them carefully and counsel them accordingly. 
Now, when it comes to uh, OCPs, I'll give my comments and I'll have uh, Dr. Neeta and Dr. Rucha uh, comment on that, um, Dr. Meera. Um, OCPs, uh, women tend not to, uh, they, they do not want to start on oral contraceptives because they're afraid of weight gain and they do not want to continue and they stop because they're concerned about weight gain. But if you look at the literature, the, uh, the information is really contradictory. Some uh, show weight gain and some clearly show even weight loss. And so both of these are indicated in the, um, uh, in the uh, list of uh, adverse effects. And uh, when it comes to hormonal contraceptives, be it patches or be it implants or be it uh, pills, um, maybe there is something to the progesterone component. Um, but uh, even with progesterone, it's more with injectables. The depo-medroxyprogesterone uh, acetate has been shown to cause some weight gain in observational studies, particularly if you look at adolescent girls. Um, and the one thing difficult to uh, assess in these studies is if you look at all the trials, um, they have looked at various uh, OCPs, various combinations, and uh, they have uh, looked at a few studies, have looked at um, you know, placebo versus hormonal contraceptives and non-hormonal uh, versus hormonal. But uh, the thing is, people who tend to gain weight are the ones who had the weight recorded, and people who didn't have weight gain, uh, you don't have much of a clear data. So, and women, as they age, they gain weight anyway. And uh, in some of these studies with the uh, OCPs um, or uh, with even DFPA, uh, the normal women gain more weight than obese women. So it is really, when you put all of this together, it is unlikely that OCPs per se cause substantial weight gain. Um, and that is what we can arrive uh, with this. And we have to counsel these women about this. And uh, I can have uh, Dr. Meera yeah. comment on it. Yeah. Um, very true, ma'am. Uh, regarding the OC pills, it's the cyclical progesterone intake, especially with the progesterone acetate, like the MPA, which people give for cycle regulation in an anovulatory PCOS, which tends to put on more weight. So it is more convincing that OC pills will not allow them to put on weight because the cycles then become regular on a OC pill. Uh, it is very hard to convince both the adolescent PCOS or the young PCOS and the parent that the moment you say a birth control pill, they take a step back. But they're very happy to be continuing the medroxyprogesterone because they are so hooked on to the last menstrual period because the entire community knows about the last menstrual period. And there's no steadfast rule that somebody should get their period clock on at 28 or 30 days because each one's cycle varies. So we have to move away from this traditional thought process and this mind churn that every 28 days she has to get a period. In fact, every three months if the girl gets the periods and four periods in a year with tricycling OC pills, that gives a better cycle regularity, avoids the excess estrogen effects on the body, better weight gain, a better weight profile and lesser weight gain because otherwise they'll be subjected to this continuous progesterone banging with either androgenic progesterones to control the bleeding or cycle regulatory progesterone. So ossipals definitely do not cause significant weight gain. Thank you. Dr. Nita, do you have uh, any comments on it? Oh, yes. Thank you, and we also welcome uh, Dr. Sarita Vajaj, Madam. Very timely entry, ma'am. Uh, the next question is actually uh, for you. I request uh, Dr. Puma to ask. Yes. Um, welcome, ma'am. How can we change the physical activity inertia among girls and women? Do we need to popularize traditional physical activities like yoga and dance or something else? And does less sitting help? So very good morning. Is it still? Very good morning to everyone. Sorry for the delay. And thank you, Usha, for the invitation. It's lovely to see everyone here. So um, uh, this is, I think there's a slide before this, but I'll come to this part a little later. So the first question is, what can be done regarding physical inertia? So the I think the fundamental need is to catch them young. So we are talking of obesity, um, 
in women majorly so if how early can we do it i don't think there's any uh, timeline defined or but how whatever it is i think that is extremely important to do it as early as possible and the earliest will be at least when they start school these days uh, uh, there's a lot of screen time if that can be avoided that's important i will be uh, addressing the latter part that is uh, sitting what is the role of sitting whether it's prolonged sitting or even bouts of sitting they also contribute a lot to at least uh, dysglycemia more of insulin resistance postprandial hyperglycemia all this has been documented and there is data to show that it contributes to weight gain as well so physical inactivity or physical inertia needs to be overcome and that will start with the family environment at school these are the two most important places where that should be addressed The regarding the dance i think that was the other question yes. the other sorts of um, there is a uh, recent data on cultural dances not only promoting or making you more physically active but mental well being as well so whether it's an whether it's african dance whether it's korean dance whether it's um, indian dance i think that is very encouraging yes dance should be promoted and what i have done here is i think you can see the two slides which uh, have there are a lot of data small studies which show you the effect of yoga on not only eating behavior but stress anxiety and um, improvement in the overall mental status as well thank you ma'am for that answer and uh, taking it further we've talked about the high prevalence we've talked about diet we've talked about physical activity but uh, i move on to dr rucha and uh, we often talk about uh, ad- abdominal obesity which is small p- a problem in the indian setting but it's clinically very difficult at times to measure these waist circumference the hip circumference so dr rucha what is your take on these uh, newer parameters like neck circumference wrist circumference in assessing obesity in women right so thanks nitin again for uh, we always need to you know be a step ahead and think of the new and nitin is always keeping us on our toes and uh, as you can see he's the single male in our women's panel this morning so yes with the indian uh, wardrobe i think that's very interesting it's very difficult to measure waist and hip parameters and also in the setting you need to make sure in your clinic or whether you're doing any camp where are you doing this so we cannot of course get away from waist and hip circumferences but another thing that i which is not on the slide is also just to mention is the waist to height ratio since why are we measuring these um, i don't know for the audience here lot of you are experts in this but we have some delegates so certainly we are looking not just at looking good this is the risk for overall metabolic syndrome i think that's a good term because it correlates to the future risk of diabetes it correlates to the future risk of cardiovascular disease so waist hip ratio has been a good correlate waist circumference as we know very well correlates very well in the indian data and we have good data now now there is increasing data for these newer parameters so one of them being a waist to height ratio the second we are starting to look at is the neck and the wrist circumference so certainly we have very again scarce data indian data i'm not even sure of maybe nitin can actually comment on that uh, but we are starting to use these parameters as well the neck circumference especially i feel works much better than even the wrist circumference that i have read in the caucasian uh, and other data um the neck circumference can correlate very well in men as well as in women for the obstructive sleep apnea component or several other components the wrist circumference i was not very convinced with the uh, data and i would like to hear what i think we need to keep in mind one more thing is the uh, the the grip strength so another thing we can look at in terms of functional is a uh, grip strength and the waist height ratio i think those should maybe be included and we try to de- generate some indian normative data so we know in the future how to use it similarly for the neck and wrist circumference again to try and generate some normative data so we can be using that 
Can I answer on that? Uh, definitely, yes, totally agree. Uh, we, I think it's about time we move from BMI as a parameter and take into account body fat composition percentage and waist and neck circumference. 40% of PCOS will have obstructive sleep apnea. It's about us spotting it much earlier. And it runs in families. In fact, there is recommendation for PCOS and for obstructive sleep apnea family screening because then we can uh, prevent the onset of cardiovascular problems and hypertension. So it is on the onus of us to behave like a seamstress rather than a doctor when the patient arrives and to take these measurements and not just the weight. Thank you. And yes, there is uh, emerging Indian data as well for neck circumference, a cutoff of 37 centimeters in men and for women, 34 centimeters in uh, women uh, neck circumference uh, is shown to correlate very well with metabolic syndrome, but more data is definitely needed. Wrist, very small studies at this point. We need more data. So this question is to Dr. Shubda. Timed eating or intermittent fasting, uh, very uh, important uh, question is all the rage now. What are your thoughts on this for obese women in general and diabetics and pre-diabetics in particular? Thank you, Dr. Puma, for this question. Um, intermittent fasting has become very popular all over the globe mm -hmm. as a weight loss tool. Uh, we all know that it is uh, not only good for weight loss, but it has shown uh, improvement in uh, metabolic health, in heart diseases, it increases lifespan. Um, but what is intermittent fasting? Simply put, it is like an eating pattern. It's not a diet plan. It does not tell you what to eat, but it tells you when to eat. Now, the limitation of the conventional uh, diet plans, the calorie-restricted diet plans that we prescribe to people, is that, that our body adapts to the calorie restriction, and that restricts the weight loss. In intermittent fasting, it circumvents that adaptation because it's cycling between uh, low calorie, brief eating periods, and then normal eating. But having said that, does that mean that intermittent fasting is superior to all other calorie restricted diets or the conventional diets that we are prescribing to people? The answer is no. No study has proven that. On the contrary, studies have proven that the weight loss we achieve with intermittent fasting is nearly similar to the weight loss we achieve with the other conventional diets. So um, where do we prescribe intermittent fasting in our clinic? So in, we prescribe intermittent fasting when we have failed with the other conventional diets that we are prescribing to the people, and especially in obese women and PCOS women. Um, we prescribe it sometimes for reversal of pre-diabetes, and we prescribe it in the early stages of type 2 diabetes when the person is obese and maybe is on a single drug like metformin. We do not prescribe intermittent fasting when the person is on multiple drugs, is on insulin, is on SGLT2 inhibitors, or has uh, eating disorders in the past or in the present, is under a lot of emotional distress, has a uh, um, bad sleeping hygiene, you know, or has tried a lot of diets, has been failing continuously, or has inconsistent eating pattern or has binge eating patterns, right? So um, the question is that whether intermittent fasting has any negative side effects on the women's health. So a recent research uh, published in Journal Obesity did say that uh, intermittent fasting can have some negative impact on the women's reproductive health. This study was done for eight weeks on pre and post menopausal women. And um, these women were actually following the warrior pattern of eating, in which they were uh, fasting for 20 hours and only eating for four hours. So uh, basically, if women fast for more than 16 hours, it can impact the period cycles. Because uh, the reproductive health of a woman basically relies on a complex carbohydrates, balanced diet, a complex carbohydrates, healthy fats, proteins, and adequate calories. So what do we recommend? We normally uh, recommend 16 to 8 uh, hours of method of uh, intermittent fasting. And in those 8 hours also, 
we give three balanced meals, which has complex carbohydrates, which has proteins, which has healthy fats, right? Uh, you know, I have seen in our, in our practice that being creatures of, uh, you know, we are creatures of extremes. You know, sometimes we have seen that women these days, because they want to do anything to lose weight, they combine intermittent fasting with keto diets. In those eight hours, they're also following keto diets. They're also using the intermittent fasting in the wrong way. They are skipping breakfast and eating late dinners, which will not give them good results, right? So um, we tell them to have three balanced meals in those eight hours. We make sure they listen to their bodies. We carefully select our patients. We make sure they are not feeling fatigued. They're feeling energized. The most important thing we tell them and definitely put it across is that they should not lose health by losing weight. Mm -hmm. They have to gain health mm -hmm. while they're losing weight. Mm -hmm. And by health, we're not only saying physical health, we're also saying mental health and emotional health. Mm -hmm. People forget that while losing weight, they should not feel distressed. Mm -hmm. They should feel happy. Mm -hmm. It's overall well-being that we're talking about. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So do, should you have a checklist of things looking at their emotional uh, health uh, how they feel physically with respect to any of the other risks they may have uh, due to obesity. Definitely, definitely. We talk about uh, their emotional obstacles. We talk about why they fail the initial diet plans. We talk about um, um, what their condition in the house is. Is it feasible for them to do that kind of diet? What is their work style, work schedules? Then only we prescribe a diet okay. to them. Yeah. Thank you. I want to address those questions just quickly. Uh, we're running short of okay. time. We've got a minute more. Okay. So we'll... Okay. Yeah, regarding the duration, if it's intermittent fasting. So if we have planned it well, diets, the if we have planned it well, then it can be a lifestyle. Right, right. Yeah. Okay, now question to Dr. Meera Raghavan. Obesity is also said to be associated with infertility. What are your thoughts on Definitely that? Definitely associated with infertility because it leads to anovulation, which is one of the primary factor for infertility in women contributes to nearly third, if not more, for the infertility. The most important factor is the woman has to be encouraged and emphasis laid on at least five to seven percent weight loss, which itself can trigger ovulation or even before she embarks on the journey of fertility treatment. If we get on to do the fertility treatment with a higher BMI, we're asking for more trouble in form of early onset GDM, hypertension, and with the attendant risk of the uh, artificial reproductive techniques of multiple pregnancy weights added on top of that insult. So it's imperative that obesity is managed first, and without that, we should not embark on the fertility treatment whatsoever. Dr. Bajaj, um, I would like your comment on this, uh, and also another important question. Now we are in the post-COVID era, we know online teaching, online classes, laying down in bed and listening to classes. Um, now it's not sitting, it's laying down. So could you please comment on that? Uh, like, I think the first question that I was addressed was the physical activity mm. part. Mm. So any um, lethargy, any activity which is promoting lethargy should intermittently at least be followed. So like I said, even prolonged sitting, or bouts of sitting are all equally deleterious. So the, you just have to become active. Mm -hmm. And somehow or the other, I think uh, we're a shade better now mm -hmm. as compared to what it was like earlier. But still, yeah, you're absolutely right. There's a, a lot of um, work from home mm -hmm. and sitting and mm -hmm. even uh, odd jobs. Yes. Whatever we are doing, we are doing it sitting, even as when we are consulting. So at least I know people who has built desks specially so they can stand and work. But I'm not sure as doctors can we stand and write prescriptions. It's a bit awkward. Or at least you can make sure that in between consultations, you know, you uh, walk. So it, it has to be inculcated, inbuilt into your daily routine. Otherwise, it will not succeed. So I think that's absolutely important. Thank you. Thank you. And I think we are really running short of time. So maybe just one crisp answer for the remaining questions. My next question to uh, Mrs. Shilpa, and this is regarding your two points that you would say for a pregnant woman with obesity, 
what would be your nutritional counseling how to defeat that eat for two theory i was just going to say that don't eat for two uh, but eat twice as well so uh, look at the quality of uh, uh, nutrition rather than quantity so a lot of emphasis on protein uh, a lot of emphasis on good quality fat and micronutrients probably that is what you want to tell uh, another thing is uh, don't eat too frequently um uh, i shouldn't i mean it sounds slightly rude but they eat as if you know these are the only 9 months and then they are not going to get food i'm sorry about this but that's the truth and lot of times there is a lot of social pressure to eat like that and i think that is something that uh, they need to work on is not eating too much because uh, they keep eating a frequency of food is also very important absolutely meeting the socio cultural norms i am from a punjabi background and i know on big ba- jar of panjeeri is given to uh, yes. the daughter in law and yes. with all the supposed ghee supposed to finish it in a day or yeah and it's impossible even i was treating doctor i am to blame because yes. i had it made for my daughters and especially took it abroad for them <laughs> <laughs> right Sorry. so just uh, two points dr <laughs> neeta what is eoss why should we use it yes So uh, EOSS is called the Edmonton Obesity Staging System and this system is basically been evolved to assess a patient for readiness for the kind of obesity treatment that can be instituted so it's not just an assess diagnostic assessment is assessment for trying to get the kind of treatment so the first and foremost thing is that once a person has a higher bmi is considered as overweight or obese the person is put through this EOSS which basically assesses patients on three counts one is metabolic disorders second is mental disorders and third is mechanical or functional disorders metabolic all of us know it could be diabetes hypertension coronary artery disease cancer even and all these are uh, graded from stage 0 to stage 4 the second is the mental ones it's it talks about anxiety nervousness depression and maybe even eating disorders or something like that and that is the second part and the third part often ignored very very important especially when you are talking about fat and fit individuals it is about the functional part also called the mechanical part people tend to ignore the mechanical complications of obesity such as obstructive sleep apnea osteoarthritis of the knees spine problems etc so these are the ones that can actually put a patient in a wheelchair without actually having diabetes or hypertension but still the quality of life the outcomes and mortality rates are going to increase based on these mechanical problems so this is a staging system which actually tells you that a person who doesn't have diabetes or hypertension is also uh, going to need treatment if that person has uh, osteoarthritis of both the knees so this is a very good staging system for prioritizing and deciding the mode of treatment of obesity in a given individual with a higher body mass index absolutely great thank you so much for that crisp answer dr bhuma just in a point single point what do you see the future of medical management of obesity to be like um again lifestyle modification diet and exercise cornerstone in patients who are not achieving weight loss with diet and lifestyle there is room for medications but they are not Uh, the first line um and again there are risks and benefits associated with various medications we know various medications came in promising called back um so there are a few that are available the glp1 analogs are very promising now um but i think we need to really counsel these patients address the risks of these medications and we have to assess them at the end of 3 months to see if they have the 5% weight loss or whatever goal that we have set and if it's not there it's not going to work and there is no point in continuing and i think uh, they need to understand it's not a prescription like any other uh, medica- any other uh, disease that they cannot take it forever and uh, lifestyle is the most important aspect of uh, management of obesity thank you dr bhuma dr rucha you were at the obesity week uh, just two points what did you get from there Okay great so I didn't know we would get to this actually so uh I will just highlight that number one there was a lot of focus from attending the obesity week in San Diego I had the fortune to meet Dr Professor Donna Ryan she's not with us today 
a uh, lot of focus on weight regain and sustainability of weight loss. So I think we focused on that today as well. And what they showed is uh, people who were on at least three anti-obesity medications versus two versus none, the chance of remaining, the weight loss uh, not coming back was about 65 to 70 percent at the end of two or three years. So three anti-obesity medications, pentyramine and topiramate was the top of the boards and we hope to have that in India. Number two, I think somebody mentioned about an acute bout of exercise since there was so much focus on it. There is a, still a possibility of browning the white adipose tissue even with acute bouts of exercise. So more is not better. A little goes a long way and fantastic uh, data by Professor Renee Rogers if anyone wants to look that up. Number three was fortunate to attend a session by Donna Ryan as well as um, Dr. Prattley talking about the future since we just mentioned I'll just hide, come jump to point number five besides the GLP-1 agents we looked at all the step protocols good weight loss with uh, we know Vigovi is going to be in uh, India hopefully next year but also in the pipeline we have GLP and GIP agonists we also have triple agonists with GLP GIP and glucagon so we have several new drugs in the pipeline there is even a CRF, so corticotropin releasing factor monoclonal antibody. And this was showing superb, just as you know, in Cushing's you gain weight. This is an anti-CRF antibody without causing hypoadrenalism. It is causing a weight loss and is showing good data. And finally, they also had semaglutide with cagrilinintide. So lots of new drugs and molecules in the pipeline and we can look forward to that. Thank you so much for that uh, wonderful crisp answer. And last question for the day to Shukta, your one single mantra, how you motivate your patients to reach that goal? Um, Dr. Nitin, thank you for this question. It's a very important question because motivation goes a long way. Uh, most of the women which come to our clinic, they already know the do's and don'ts, but still they are not doing it. They know what to avoid to reach a, a weight loss goal. Uh, the idea is that only negative calorie balance and running on a treadmill does not lead to weight loss. You have to work around the beliefs and the barriers of the patient. You have to know why they want to lose weight. The reason has to be right. Appearance cannot only be the reason. It has to be health and that goes a long way. Um, setting smart goals, which are, you know, uh, very, very important. You have to make sure that they are achievable goals. You have to appreciate small achievements. You have to set a positive body image, very, very important for women. You have to listen, which is very important again for women. They have very few people who actually sit down and listen to their woes. You have to listen. Um, the two techniques, the strategies that I really use is bathe technique, which brings out a lot of information. Bathe is you ask about the background. You ask about uh, um, how is it affecting them, which is BA. Then you ask about what is troubling about it in their lives, how they handle it, and then you empathize. By using the bait technique, this is a psychological technique, you bring out a lot of information from them. The second technique that I really use is the five R's, okay? Which is um, the, uh, the first R is relevant, risk, reward, roadblocks, and repetition. So these two counseling techniques I really use with my patients and which helps us to bring uh, to remove the barriers and help the women with weight loss. Thank, Thank you, you so much for sharing those secrets. Uh, very helpful to all of us. And I think, yes, as mentioned, it's important to encourage even no weight gain uh, is uh, achievement that we talk about. I think with this, we come to an end of the session. I think, uh, as was mentioned, even fighting these quacks is also equally important. We need more advocacy. We need more sessions like this.